I speak as chair of the committee of OFM DFM, therefore uh, I'm not supposed to engage in anything that could be interpreted as party political or personal, and that's why the committee clerk is here staring at me laser-like to, to make sure I stay in the, on the, the straight and narrow. The theme um, is, is superb, always happy to support one of these events. Shared future couldn't be more topical, could not be more important to the future of Northern Ireland. And in my a couple of minutes, I'm, I'm going to use as a theme uh, Paul Nolan's excellent peace monitoring report number two. This is the second time Dr. Nolan has looked uh, at the statistics and the hard facts uh, beyond the commentary. And I'm delighted to say Paul's in the front row here. Uh, just to stray just once from the straight and narrow, uh, I missed this first time through on page 87, chart 91, uh, it's high net worth individuals in the UK. And, and of course, uh, there are more multimillionaires in London than anywhere else, but actually, uh, Paul has identified that in Belfast, uh, there are no fewer than 96 multimillionaires. Uh, now, I am currently a very happily married man, but I have to say this, this, changes, this changes everything, Paul. 35.8 multimillionaires per 100,000 of the population. So I've just mentioned it because the statistics in here are fascinating, surprising, and at times challenging. Uh, in his report, Paul picks out 10 themes, uh, which I think are relevant to what you're talking about today. Number one, he points out that the underlying momentum of the peace process during 2012 was actually strong. Uh, surprising when you consider how the year ended, but actually it was one of the most peaceful uh, for 40 years. Secondly, Northern Ireland is now a society made up of minorities where religious background does not necessarily determine uh, your national identity. And of course, the 2011 census for the first time asked a question uh, about uh, your national identity. And uh, while 48% of the population said they were Protestant by background, only 40% chose uh, to say that they were British. So there is uh, a clear uh, division between these two areas. Uh, point three was there's increasing ease with difference in what is now an irreversibly heterogeneous society. Uh, number four pertinent to this building, the assembly has faltered as a legislative chamber. The concentration of power in the executive has had the corresponding effect of diminishing the centrality of the assembly as a decision-making body. Uh, number five, uh, the real debates uh, on national identity are taking place elsewhere, while too much attention has been paid to symbolic issues in Northern Ireland. And Paul makes clear, while the Republic of Ireland has been pulled tighter into a centralising European Union, uh, the magnetic forces in the UK are, are pushing uh, the constituent states or uh, countries uh, in the, the other direction. Number six, the fragility of the peace process uh, has increased uh, because of continued absence of a policy on division and how to tackle it. And number seven, some paramilitaries have been marginalized, but others have been granted a measure of legitimacy. Number eight, the flag dispute has exposed the alienation of sections uh, of working class loyalism. And number nine, there's been a decline of residential segregation and an expansion of shared space. And again, that's maybe a, a, a finding that goes contrary uh, to the narrative you might hear in the media or indeed in politics. And finally, inequality gaps persist, but they are perceived differently. Uh, and I think that is incredibly pertinent given the current row that we're hearing portrayed in the media uh, at the heart of OFM, DFM, uh, over the distribution of the social investment fund, that 80 million pound pot. Do you give it out based on need or does there have to be some kind of one for you, uh, one for us in terms of our two traditional communities? So, of course, not everybody will agree with all of the conclusions, but uh, while some things are changing in Northern Ireland, it's clear that other patterns uh, remain the same. Uh, the emphasis uh, must be on need and the need to keep abreast of the most up-to-date research uh, of these issues. The Committee of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister has remained engaged on these matters. We hear evidence regularly, victims and survivors issues, uh, earlier this month and again yesterday. Uh, we've been briefed on the latest manifestation of good relations policy, together building a united community. Uh, and we've heard about the latest plans 
uh, with regard to the Peace, Long, uh, the Peace Centre at Bay's Long Cash. Uh, we're now looking for an update uh, given the reversal uh, over the, the summertime. And that cancellation of the Peace Centre, uh, the presence of Dr. Richard Haas and his team for the talks uh, on, on the future, it means that what you're do, dealing with today is, is extremely, extremely uh, important. I mean, for my money, Dr. Haas is looking at, at, at two tangibles, flags and parades, and then at the more difficult issue of dealing with the past. I believe there are three issues that we need to tackle to be able to move forward uh, confidently, dealing with the past, reconciliation, uh, and a shared future. And probably the first thing to do uh, to in order us to tackle those issues is to see if we can find a common definition, a common understanding of what those really mean. Uh, so I'm delighted that we're looking at uh, a shared future uh, this afternoon uh, in this seminar. So uh, having said all that, Michael will, will be operating the, the controls uh, for the slide presentation. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce your first speaker this afternoon, Professor Mike Tomlinson uh, of Queen's University in Belfast on the theme of the legacies of the conflict, the evidence. Mike. The Poverty and Social Exclusion Survey that was carried out across the UK in 2012 included a module that is unique to Northern Ireland. This was a block of 10 questions designed to capture people's experience of conflict-related events, such as the death and injury of close friends and relatives, what people have witnessed in terms of violent events, such as bomb explosions, rioting, and so on, and significant conflict-related events, such as imprisonment or having to move house because of threats or attack. There would be a debate about whether these are the right questions, but these are the questions that, on the basis of custom and practice and what we understand to be the prevalence of the most important conflict-related events, uh, suggested themselves. This module allows us to explore the links between troubles experience and the wide range of data on poverty and social exclusion that we've captured elsewhere in the survey. This is the very first time that we have presented the data to a public audience, and it's, it's a pleasure to do so at this, uh, uh, in this building, and I think it's very appropriate that we do so. It is very much a first take on the data, and I'm keen to get people's reactions on what would be useful to look at next, and how the data can be linked directly to policy discussions more directly, whether this is around labour market inactivity, health and social care priorities, welfare reform, or the specific concerns of victims and survivors. This is what we're going to cover. I'm using the royal we here, incidentally. I don't know if you notice that. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about what happened, the prevalence of each type of experience. Um, I think we need to be thinking about intensity of experience, and there's lots of different ways that you can combine the variables that we've got, and I'll give you a couple of ideas around that. We're also interested in when the worst experience took place. I think this is very important in people's minds as to what was significance for them and when did it actually happen, and we can relate that to the violent experiences to get some sense of time periods. Then there's the question of uh, who does this weigh upon most and how do we look at um, the social variables in this, this regard. And I've taken some of the basic ones today, gender, community background, the traditional equality measure. We could have put in national identity, but we haven't done that today. Age is very important. Is there a sense in which this issue the experience of conflict belongs to a particular generation which is dying out or is the carryover in some way to younger populations. And then households, the adults that have experienced the most conflict, what kinds of households do they live in? This, this can tell us some interesting things as well. But obviously we have a, a, a huge amount of data to describe the, the social position of people, and this is just a, a selection of, of what's available from the survey. 
Then I want to move on to dabble in uh, what are the impacts, what might we associate that conflict experience with. And I'm going to look at unemployment. We have lots of data on unemployment. I'm just picking off a couple of variables in relation to that. Deprivation, we, this is a poverty and social exclusion survey. It's concerned with low income and it's concerned with the extent to which people are actually deprived of the basic necessities of life. So we're going to use a measure of deprivation of three or more of our 22 necessity items to see whether this has any um, relationship to troubles experience. And then the all-important, what can we say about people's mental and physical health in relation to conflict experience? So that's the menu. Whether we'll get through it all in 20 minutes is another matter. Okay, so we begin by asking the question, thinking of the troubles, this is how we phrased it, thinking of the troubles, did you experience any of the following? Okay. Now, I'm going to show the answers not in the order that they were presented to people, but in the order that's useful to present them. So, no one close was killed, okay? So, you can work out from that that 35% of adults say that a close friend or relative or someone they knew personally was killed. And for half of that proportion, it was a close friend uh, or a relative. So, those are the basic frequencies now, obviously, people can answer more than one of those things, so we need to be looking at that, and this is where we bring in intensity, and we can see there that 17% of all adults will say that either a close friend or relative was killed. And for a small minority of the population of adults, we're talking about close to 7% of the adult population claiming that two or more of a close friend, close relative, and someone else they know personally was killed during the conflict. Then we move on to injury, same question, but about injury. And here we can see that a third of adults, that's 100 minus 67, know someone who was injured. Not shown is the 3.9% who answered, I was physically injured. But this is a pretty interesting group because so you can't get more intense than tense and experience than, than injury to self. When the same question was asked 10 years ago in the, the first run out of, of the survey, about 8% gave that answer. So I don't know what's happened to the 4% in between. There's obviously a question we have to look at there. Then we come on to intensity and you'll notice that in your pack, if you're reading the slides from the pack, there's a mistake in the pack, but the correct result is actually shown uh, here when it comes to intensity. Those figures should be about injury. So we're talking about either close friend or relative was injured, a figure of 24.5%, so a quarter of the population know either a close friend or a close relative who was injured in the conflict. Two or more close friends, close relatives, and other comes out slightly higher than the killing rate. So injury is sort of pushing up the figures compared to, compared to death. Then we move on to witnessing various events. And uh, what that first figure means, if you take 43.4 from 100, again, what it means is that 57% of the adult population have witnessed a violent event. That, that's what that means. So we're still in a situation where the majority of the adult population have experienced serious violence of one kind or another. They've witnessed a bomb explosion. It could be in the dim and distant past, but nevertheless, that's what we're looking at here. They've witnessed rioting, a bomb explosion, gunfire someone being assaulted, and other forms of undefined serious violence, which picked up a 10% response, which is quite interesting. It means that the scale or the definitions that we're using are not sensitive to all of the experiences that people have had. And remarkably, the survey picked up 3% who'd actually witnessed a, a murder. So then we move on to some of the other categories that we, we measured, other events related to the conflict. 
we asked whether people knew anybody who'd spent time in prison as a result of the conflict. And you can see that a fifth of the adult population knows somebody who's been in prison. Now, that, that is not normal by any circumstances in, in, in terms of um, any other kind of society, that one in five people actually know someone personally who has, has been in, in prison. House searches, this level of house searches, this tends to belong to the past. We'll come on to the evidence around that. But you're talking about around 9% of the population has had their house searched by the police, or not the population, of adults have had their house searched by the police or the army. 4.4% have had to move house because of threats, intimidation, harassment. I think we use four words to try to capture this. And a slightly smaller proportion have um, had to leave their job for the same kinds of, of reason. And we'll, we'll make some comments about when these things happened uh, in a moment. We then asked, thinking of the worst thing that happened to you because of the troubles, and we didn't ask them to sort of relate that back to the answers that they'd given. Thinking about the worst thing that happened to you because of the troubles, when was this? And people were presented with, I think, something like seven time bands. The last one, slightly unsatisfactory, in that we sort of said post-1998. But the rest were all in four-year time bands, okay, starting from the early years. So this is what you, you get, okay? The time bands are across the, the bottom there, and each point represents the proportion of adults saying yes to a troubles experience um, allocated to the appropriate time band. I think that profile is expected, except that the pr proportion for after 1998 is earlier than for two earlier time periods. But of course, it's a longer time period, so you could, you could quibble with that, I guess. Um, but it's, it's bigger than 1984 to 1988 and 1994 to 1998. One factor in particular appears to be pushing up the, the post-1998 value. Um, we've, we've done a correlation matrix on this to try to see you, you know, what is really shaping that. And it appears to be witnessing an assault. Witnessing, witnessing an assault belongs much more to the contemporary period than the past. Witnessing murder belongs very much to the 70s. Witnessing bomb explosions, as you'd expect, belongs very much to the 70s. But witnessing an assault, which people identify as being connected to the troubles, is much more uh, in the contemporary period. It's much more 1994 uh, onwards. Now, the final question followed up this worst thing notion by asking people, because of this event, did you, and then people were presented with something like six options. And it was around, did you go to your GP? Did you consult a counselor or other mental health professional? Did you join a campaign group? Did you join a support group? What, what, what did you do as a result of this? And um, what I think is interesting about this is firstly that very few people who'd experienced <coughs> violence followed it up by seeking help. What we make of that, we, we need to look into. But we get a figure of about 13.4% of people responding to the violence by following it up in some way, by a visit to the GP or whatnot. And we find that a third had gone to their GP of that 13.4%, and just under a quarter to a counsellor or other mental health professional. So overall, I estimate that's about 4% of all adults have gone to their GP or a mental health professional as a result of a conflict-related event. So whether you take that as an expression of met need or unmet need be becomes an issue, uh, which again needs to be further explored. Now we come on to who, who experienced, sorry. Now we come on to who experienced various things. And we'll start with uh, the differences between men and women. We'll start with gender. And here's a scatter plot of the responses 
to witnessing an explosion, witnessing a murder, divided between uh, men and women. We have 26 points, 26 values in relation to the 10 questions that we, we answered. And for 21 of these, men have a greater risk of experiencing the event. Men are twice as likely to have experienced the death of a close friend. They're 2.4 times as likely to have witnessed a murder. They're three times as likely to have been injured themselves. And men, according to the data, were 12 and a half times more likely to go to prison. Actually, when you look at the prison stats, it's probably even higher than that, but that, that's what is registering in the, the survey. Having said that, there are problems with this level of analysis. We, down the bottom end, we have very small cell sizes and very small percentages. So the extent to which we can say these things are actually statistically significant is somewhat diminished. So we've got to do further work to accumulate some of these values to make sense of them. But statistical significance uh, and validity and reliability applies to about 10 out of these factors. So when we're, we're getting to the points which are further away from the line and in the mid-range of the, the values there around, you know, between 20, over 20 percent, you're talking about statistically significant uh, results. And you'll want to know what those are. I think it's in the, in the text. And then we come on to community background. This is the pattern here. Uh, Looking at this, we find that six of the 26 conflict uh, events, Protestants are more likely than Catholics to have experienced the event. We're talking about close friend killed, close relative killed, close friend injured, witnessing of a bomb explosion, a close friend in prison, which is an interesting one, and other person you know in prison, which is not actually shown on the graph. And two of these appear to be statistically uh, significant. The close friend injured and other person I know uh, was in prison. Catholics are more likely to have witnessed a murder 1.6 times and to have had a close relative in prison 1.9 times. Catholics were almost four and a half times as likely than Protestants to have their house searched. Seven events we think are, statistic, are statistically significant in terms of the differences either side of that line. Two in relation to Protestants, five in relation to Catholics. In terms of similarity of experience, knowing someone who was killed, witnessing riots, having to move house, visiting the GP are all shared factors in this. The differences, the statistically significant differences are about close relatives being injured, someone else being injured that you know personally, witnessing an assault, witnessing other serious violence, and knowing somebody who was in prison, witnessing gunfire and house searches. Am I okay for time? Yeah. We're now going to look at age. We're going to look at age bands. And the simple thing to do here is to gather the data up between two age bands. If you like, a troubles generation, the people that were young in the worst years, and look at the um, 45 to 64-year-olds versus the 16 to 34-year-olds. And you would expect most of these risk ratios to be well above one, the older group experiencing more than the younger groups. And for the most part, that's what we find. The older group is 3.9 times as likely to have witnessed a bomb explosion as the younger group. That obviously corresponds with what we've seen and heard around the worst thing uh, data. However, and this is interesting, and we have to explore this further, I'm sharing a discovery of the last few days with you here. Witnessing an assault is more associated with the 1990s onwards rather than with the early years. And this is reflected in table three that you've got in your uh, bulletin, in your briefing paper, where the older group is less likely, with a risk ratio of 0.7, to have witnessed an assault than the younger group. And I think it's there, yes, it's the very last figure down the bottom right-hand uh, corner here.
the younger group, and again, I think this is interesting in terms of the transmitting of kind of violence experience and culture down to the next generation, the younger group is more likely to say they know someone who has spent time in prison because of the troubles. They're twice as likely to give this answer for a close relative and others than respondents in the older group. I think, I think that's a really interesting finding which we've got to explore further. What is behind that? What does that mean? One of the most commonly witnessed events, rioting, I think the prevalence there is, what, 35%, 33%, something like that, has a similar risk level between the age bands. So rioting, clearly, the experience of rioting is not dying out. I mean, we would expect that intuitively from what we see out there, but it's, an, it, it's corroborated by the survey data here. It's not wholly loaded. Uh, it's, it's not exactly even. It's somewhat loaded towards the older group. The older group is 1.2 times as likely to mention this as a conflict experience. But um, that's not a statistically significant difference from what uh, we can see. So what about um, households? Uh, here's some data to take home with you and study in the comfort of your own home. Uh, what type of households are the adults living in? Those color bands are trying to segregate pensioners as an age group from non-pensioners, non-pensioners who are living without children from, in the pink band at the end, households with children, whether they're headed by single parents uh, or not. And then we've got all adults at the end. So what you're trying to do is look at the risk between a particular household characteristic and that of all adults for these particular things. A close friend being killed, yourself being injured, or witnessing a murder. I've just plucked these ones out for illustration. And uh, at least two of them involve very small numbers, so they may not be useful in terms of future analysis. But the killing of a close friend or losing a close friend through a killing is a useful one, and you can see some of the differences. Adults living in households with children, whether headed by one parent or not, have lower rates of conflict experience than all adults. That's across the board, not shown here. Single pensioners have lower rates for two of the events shown here, injury to self being the exception, for which they have 1.4 times the overall adult rate. The single non-pensioner households, who are predominantly men in this category, have much higher rates of experience of all three events, 2.5 times in the case of injury to self. So there's something going on here about men living on their own and what's happened to them. Uh, uh, during the period of conflict. So what about the impacts? We have to move on very quickly here. Here's a table about unemployment and deprivation, looking at the percentages in each category. I have to cut a very long story short here. What we've tried to do here is group together experience and compare people who have no troubles experience at all or no experience of killing an injury, I should say, with people that have experienced some kind of a killing of a close friend, close relative, and so on, an injury, or both a killing and an injury, okay? So those are the numbers, and we've tried to associate that with unemployment and deprivation. We can, comp yes, okay, so group two, experience of killings only has lower unemployment, 12 months or more in the last five years, and deprivation than the nun category. That, again, is a very interesting finding. What does that mean? Uh, is it a statistical artifact due to the low numbers, or is there something real going on about that, that experience? Both groups in three and four, however, when you bring injury into the picture, um, and, you know, there may be something about demographic change here and the, the death of survivors going on here. Uh, we, we, this raises more questions than answers, I have to say. But when we come on to groups three and four, we have significantly raised deprivation rates compared to the nun category and marginally raised uh, unemployment as defined just by this variable of 12 months or more experienced in the last five years. Nearly there. Now, there was a 
Yesterday, if you were watching um, uh, the Office of National Statistics press release site, as I'm sure all of you do, you'll have seen that there was a release on the so-called happiness questions, the personal well-being questions. There are four of these questions, and one of them is about life satisfaction. Um, how do you rate your, your overall satisfaction with life these days? And you're asked to imagine a scale of naught to 10 and place yourself. And the headline news of this was that people in Northern Ireland are much happier than everywhere else in, in the UK because a third, 33% of people when asked this life satisfaction question uh, give a score of nine or 10. And this is the highest in the, of any of the UK uh, countries. So. We reflect this figure to a certain extent. The figures for GB for 2012, 2013, if you concentrate on the top row and on the end score, the average rating of overall life satisfaction in GB is 7.45 running at the moment. And then look at the bottom to no troubles experience and you get a figure of 7.68. So indeed, there appears to be higher life satisfaction, certainly amongst people that have got no association with the conflict. But then you begin to relate the figures. You begin to cross-tabulate life satisfaction with experience of conflict. And you get figures in the end row here that are equivalent to the most unhappy, unsatisfied people in the UK who are the unemployed and people with disabilities and long-standing illness. So that, that's what that is designed to show. As I say, it needs to be taken away and studied for further uh, <coughs> involvement in that, to, to, to comprehend it. Now, what we've done here is we've taken particular experiences and we've produced a risk ratio between those people who have the experience and those people who haven't got the experience. And we've cross-tabbed this with the general health questionnaire, which is uh, 12 questions. If you produce a score of four or more on this, you're supposed to be in psychological stress. That's the, the, the scale here. The question about whether you've, uh, you know, what your general health is like, is it bad, very bad, and whether you've got a, a long-standing illness for, for 12 months uh, or not. And for every single one of these factors, except one, the risk is raised by the experience of the conflict. And in some cases, the risk is more than double, okay? So this is a, a pretty important uh, piece of evidence about the relationship between troubles experience and health. The exception is about the mental health of people that have been in prison which seems to be better than the general population. <laughs> but <laughs> again, <laughs> it's, it's a finding, um, and uh, it's, it's a finding that may be wiped away by small cell sizes and by further investigation. But just looking at the raw results, it's the only one that's below one, okay, at point nine. Better mental health, they, they score below, people who have been in prison as a result of the conflict are scoring below uh, everybody else in terms of their risk ratio. For some conflict experiences, the risk of poor health is only marginally increased, but for others, there is a much more significant association with poor health. Losing a close friend appears to be more important to adverse health than losing a close relative. Injury to self always stands out as having the highest risk ratios across the board. Witness, witnessing a murder, witnessing an assault, and other serious violence, they're all associated with high risk ratios, as are moving house, moving a job, and house searches, though to a lesser extent. So, to conclude very quickly, the next step is to produce a convincing intensity measure. We're looking at various ways of, of doing this particular life events being associated with adverse risk of, of ill health. Can we use some of those scales that have been used since the 1970s? Um, not, not, not here, but within the psychology um, discipline to, uh, to uh, produce a convincing intensity measure. We're looking at that. Can we define 
the real characteristics which determine adverse effects. If you've risked this, if you've risked that, if that's happened to you, then you're very vulnerable in terms of in particular outcomes. I suggest that we've probably got between 15 and 20 percent of the adult population who tend to be older rather than younger. They're predominantly male, often alone, but with connections to relatives, which means that younger people are hearing about the experiences of older generations. That's the kind of picture that's beginning to emerge from this. But I think there are other possible scenarios and other ways of making use of the data, such as linking to the census. We could be linking to administrative data sets that could be both uh, substantiate what we're seeing in the PSE data or point in new directions. You've been very indulgent, Chair. Thank you.